So thank you all so much for coming. Um, I'm Helen Scales. Um, I'm a marine biologist. And in case anyone's wondering, that is my real name, uh, Scales <laughs> Fish. Uh, um, and this evening we're going to talk about and discuss um, how, whether and how the digital world that basically so many of us live in, how that can really help people connect with and care a bit more about the oceans. Um, I think if Jacques Cousteau was still alive, he would be astounded by how far technology has come and what we can do now and just how much the ocean realm has opened up to everyone. I mean, these days it's possible to have a high definition video camera four miles beneath the waves, taking pictures of bizarre creatures clinging to the side of a hydrothermal vent. And those images can be beamed all around the world instantly for everyone to see. And that's just extraordinary. Things like Google Earth, Google Maps, um, means we can use our computers as a kind of portal into the oceans. These are things I think a few years ago we would never have imagined. Um, you know, it's just wonderful things going on. In terms of my personal involvement with the digital world, um, I use various of the kind of online social media tools to communicate ideas about marine science and marine conservation. Um, and I guess I really do it just to try and share my own fascination and passion for sea, for sea life, for the things that live there. Um, and, you know, just find other people to, to kind of tell these things about. I, you know, I take part in a blog called The Sea Monster. Um, I make podcasts. I hang about on Facebook and Twitter and generally talk about fish and how awesome the oceans are. And, you know, and I love it. And I find it's a really wonderful way to to communicate just ideas and information to other people all around the world. I think the idea of bringing this global community together of people who, who already love the sea or who didn't, but maybe love it a bit more because there's me there saying these things. I love that. Um, in fact, I've got a rather wonderful... My favourite tweet has been converted into a kind of <laughs> analogue tweet, um, which, is, which is here. I don't know if you can all, all read it. Um, this, was, this is my favourite tweet. It was sent out a while ago when I was on a radio programme, and I will read it out in case you can't read it. It's, um, it was sent out on the, the QI, uh, which is the TV series, um, uh, Twitter account to about half a million people and it reads, the seahorse is the only fish with a neck and the only species on earth in which the male gives birth via Helen Scales. <laughs> and I still haven't found out if the person who sent that tweet, who shall remain nameless, um, meant to leave out the comma before the via and therefore made it a joke that everyone caught on and suddenly I had like dozens more followers and, and it was brilliant and for just a little time seahorse sex trended on Twitter and I'm very <laughs> proud of that it was wonderful so um, so that is my favorite tweet and come and come along and actually touch it which is unusual for a tweet isn't it um, so that's brilliant um, so yes so I mean there's no denying I think today that we all um, we basically all are our lives are ruled by screens, most of us. You know. and the, I think the question that we want to really partly get to today is, does that, do those screens stand between us and nature and the oceans in particular? Or do they open up a new window into this mysterious realm? Do, does technology and does the digital world, does it help us to understand more about the fabulous things that live in the oceans and the problems they face, uh, the wonderful discoveries that are coming out, and, um, and ultimately why it all matters? Does it help us to understand that a bit more? Well, to discuss this and plenty more, we have a very distinguished panel of a trio of wonderful people around me, um, and um, they all have particular connections to the oceans and to the digital world. So that's why they've been brought um, here today. Um, there will be plenty of opportunity for you all to ask questions and throw your ideas out um, and to stir the debate. So please, you know, grab onto those thoughts, hold onto them, and, and we will give you a chance very shortly to, to have your say. So have a think about that. Um, but first, I think we should have a chance, give our panel a chance to introduce themselves and tell us a bit more about what they do. And I think I'm going to start with Tom. Yeah, Tom Hooper is one of those marine conservationists who has a really enviable CV, which clearly combines a deep passion for what he does uh, with um, a fabulous opportunity to live in some extraordinary places. Um, you've headed conservation projects all around the world, it seems, from tiny Indian Ocean islands to a very big Indian Ocean island, and the coast of Africa to the coast of Cornwall and Devon. Um, in all your work and travels, you must have seen some really incredible things in the oceans, but also you presumably have witnessed many of the problems as well. How does that kind of 
lie with you after all these years of being in the oceans and, and enjoying it? I find it difficult to reconcile. Uh, as a, I've always wanted to be in, on, under, around the sea, and people who don't want to, I find that quite difficult to understand. <laughs> uh, it's a... I think the sea, in one sense, has all the advantages of being somewhere which is enthralling. It's, it's an adventure, and people obviously flock to the sea for a reason. But at the same time, we are, in terms of conservation, we are losing the battle. There's no doubt about that in my mind. There's no statistic which will argue the other way. So I'm always in my job trying to reconcile why that is. And when you work in marine conservation, I recognise that I'm, I'm a scientist. I'm trained to, to, to recite facts, to, to use graphs and figures to back those facts up. But actually, it's probably the worst training I could possibly have to do marine conservation. And what I've learned in working with some of the people here and, and, um, and, and Nick at JP Creative, it's, it's about communicating. And I think in one, in one sense, we're very used to saying, here's a massive problem. You know, it's a, a, a garbage site the size of Texas in the middle of the Pacific. Isn't it terrible? What are you going to do about it, housewife in Swindon? And she's going, well, I, I don't really know. And what can I possibly do? I, there's nothing, I don't have the power. So we've got to stop doing that, stop scaring people with the scale of the problem and start just packaging it up much better. And I think one of the things that I'm, I'm realising now that, that we must stop scaring people with the scale of the problem and get into uh, talking about it much more sensibly. That's excellent. And, um, and you know, I won't give away how many years you've been working in conservation, but it's been a few... I'm a child of the 70s. <laughs> but presumably, um, as well as seeing changes take place in the ocean, you've, you've also, your career has spanned the invention of things like the internet. You know, this didn't exist, <laughs> right? I mean... <laughs> or at least the use of it in every... You know, the fact that we all carry around computers in our pockets and we're all connected, that's something yeah. that's new. And has that... Is it, is, how has that entered your work? And has it, has it affected the way you do your work and the way you... Communicate. Is it something that? Okay, I'll tell you. I'll yeah. tell you honestly. I I am. Yeah, I'm a child of the seventies, and and you're still using Walkman and. Uh, I was. Tapes. I did. Yeah, we did <laughs> used to make tapes for our girlfriends <laughs> with all the songs on. But I I um, as a as a dad now, I worry. I'm a bit of a a Victorian in that I do worry about their what they call screen time in the in the the, the, the discussion papers. I think if I gave, we live 300 metres from a beautiful estuary in Cornwall. If I gave my kids the choice between spending time on a computer or going to the estuary, I know, I don't even need to test them, I know that they'd rather spend time in front of the screen. So I worry, I worry, and I think we're here in London, and remember, we're not that far from the sea anywhere in the UK, and I worry that kids are spending too much time in front of screens, and they would rather spend time in front of the digital than the real. So... I have taken big classrooms of kids to the sea. There's a wonderful beach called Wembury, which is you know, fantastic rock pools. And after the experience, I asked them to, to, to put their hands up who had never been rock pooling their lives before. This is in Devon. And I would say 95% of those kids had never been rock pooling. So I think the greatest challenge we have in marine conservation is not about the broadcasting, it's not about the digital and I've got some great examples which digital have really helped, really they've pushed the balance for some really significant marine conservation gains. I can talk about those, but it has no doubt has helped. But when it comes to the longer term, when it comes to really sorting out the root of this problem, it's about people thinking, I care about this, I, want, I experience it, I feel it, I touch it, I smell it, all of those things. If it's done through screens, then I'm not sure... We're going to really make it. So make we have to find ways of making digital get people out there, and that's and, and, you know connect them with the ocean in the real world as well as you know find ways of using this to, to, to get people off their bums and out there into the. Into the there's no doubt, and there's we can have examples of this, but there's no doubt in my mind of if that stuff on the TV, the great um, BBC Natural History stuff that we've got. Definitely, I have no proof for this whatsoever, but I, I, anybody want to argue against it, it inspires people mm. to go out and see stuff. But equally, 
you want to, we want to find ways of getting them to interact with it. So maybe we've got, all got cameras. You know, you want, there are various apps now getting people to photograph stuff, to record it, to discuss what it is, where it lives. So I'm, I'm more in favour of the, those kind of applications which are encouraging people to, um, to, to go places and, and talk about it. And we've got Man on the Beach here, and it's a, it's a classic example of that kind of interaction. Great. Setting you up nicely. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we'll come to we'll come to Man on the Beach just in a second. We'll leave that hanging just for a sec. That's yeah. great. Right, um, so we've already got a few ideas of the, the the two sides of the coin when it comes to oceans and digital. But I think I want to pass over now to Helen. Um, Helen Webb's with us as well. She's co-founder of a fantastic uh, marine conservation charity called Sea Changers, and they essentially provide much needed funds for marine conservation and science projects here in the UK. And they do it by tapping money from the people who already love the sea, the people who love to be by the sea, surf and sail across the sea, dive into the sea. Um, and, um, and they are the ones you're sort of finding as uh, giving them an opportunity to help. And um, I should say that we met in a very digital way. This is really rather wonderful. We, um, Helen was a listener to a podcast I, I made called Naked Oceans, which um, is part of the Naked Scientists uh, group coming out of Cambridge University. And, and she got in touch to say if I'd be interested in getting involved. And I, I do a little bit of back behind the scenes um, helping with sea changes, just um, a bit of technical advice on their science um, and conservation projects that apply for money, so helping to make a bit of a decision about where the money goes. But I felt, when, when Helen first got in touch, I really, I really did get feel drawn to the idea of sea changes. Um, really because it's touching on something that Tom's already mentioned. It really helped answer a question that I get asked, and I'm sure you all do, um, a lot. And I get asked by listeners and by readers and people on Twitter and all sorts of friends. And that is, what can I do to help? You know, I spend a lot of my time talking and writing about the wonders of the ocean and the problems. And again, as Tom has touched on, sometimes perhaps we talk a bit more about the, the latter. Um, but yeah, the question is, what can I do to help? Mm. And it seems to me, Helen, that you know, you're addressing that. But also, that must be where you began and where the idea for Sea Changes came was because you wanted to do something, something to, yeah. to help. I mean, just a little bit of background. My, my starting point was I was a diver and had been, di been diving for about 10 to 15 years all over the world, uh, a little bit in the UK, it was a little bit cold for me, but I had dived in the UK, but all over. And during that time, I became aware of not only the beauty of the ocean, totally fell in love with diving, totally fell in love with what I was seeing under the water and was, you know, became, I'm definitely an obsessed diver, uh, as is Rachel, who started the organisation with me. Um, but over that time became aware of a problem and that need to do something about it very quickly. And so I guess in the sort of around three years ago I thought, okay, what, what do I as a passionate diver do to make a difference? And use digital as my sort of route in to answer that question for me. Hence the fact I um, started to listen to Helen's podcast and I uh, also followed a blog site that Helen's involved in. And I suppose I went on a journey of sort of ask, find, trying to find out what the issues were around the ocean because I'd noticed changes, I'd noticed issues. Um, but I also wanted answers about what, I was, what our solution was going to be uh, to do that. I never thought in, my, in, in any sort of um, realm that I was going to start a charity. Um, I just thought I, I, I was a, an engaged, enthusiastic, passionate C user, and I wanted to uh, take that forward. And from that came a very sort of simple idea, which was, OK, let's build a giant turnstile on the sea. So... Obviously, we haven't done that yet. Uh, you, you can't go and see it yet anywhere. It'd be great if you could. Um, but the idea was very simple, that if I go into the sea uh, as a diver, I have an impact, whether that's because of the fuel from the dive boat or whether that's uh, just the pure um, fuel getting to the beach with my tanks. Uh, but actually, so do sailors have an impact, so the surface, so the people going cruises. Actually, you have an impact if you just go to the beach. Um, and marine businesses, the people who make their money from the beach, also have an impact. And it was trying to say, OK, let's put a turnstile on the sea where everybody contributes something. Uh, so, we had a, so Rachel and I had a great idea, which was, uh, let's harness this energy and passion that, uh, that we had for the sea um, and almost get, try and get everyone to put a pound in the pot. And if we had all the people who felt passionate about the sea to put a pound in the pot, that's a lot of pounds, and you can do a lot with that money. So that, that was our starting point, was simply passion uh, and trying to harness passion and out of that came this idea of sea changes. If we could do that, if everybody who went to the beach for a day put a pound in the pot, wow, you could do all sorts of things. You could fund marine reserves, you could fund giant cleanups, you could 
um, you know, safe species, you could do loads of research and education, and what an amazing thing that would be. Um, so naively, I, I had no marine conservation background, I had no charity background, I just thought it's a good idea. Why don't we do that? Um, now, somebody said to me, we were chatting today, and somebody said, oh, actually, if you always thought through and were well informed, you probably wouldn't do anything. So actually, that was a very good starting point. I knew nothing, <laughs> felt very optimistic, felt, it, felt passionately in love with the sea, um, and we started to see changes, and that was a very sort of simple idea was, OK, let's get everyone to contribute. And from the idea of fundraising, which was where we started from, we also realised that people didn't just want to put a pound in a pot. Lots of people do, which is great. Um, but actually, people want to take small actions or get ideas about the difference we can make. So the idea developed into uh, creating a community of sea changes or people who will take small actions in their everyday life, whether they live in Leicester, which is about as landlocked as where I live, about as landlocked as you can get, uh, actions that I can take in Leicester to whether it's actions that you take as a diver or a surfer or a sailor or just as a business, things that everybody can do to make a difference. And so that's kind of where the idea is. It's a very new organisation, but that's where it's evolved yeah, from. Yeah, I mean, you're new, but you're doing very well and you've already raised thousands and we're handing it out and deciding who to have it. And there's some fantastic projects coming forward. That's actually, right, yeah. Which is really nice to sort of see that happening already. Um, and you, you touched on this already, but I guess... You know, 10 or 20 years ago, sea changes could have existed. This could have worked. But now we've got this digital connected world, so it's a different thing, I imagine. How, how do you feel that having that other sort of avenue of, of talking to people and finding people, how is that shaping what you originally set out to do? Uh, sorry, Helen. I was, I was no. saying, I think for us, it, it changed the conversation really quickly. So I think we set out with just the idea that we would raise pots and pots of money. Um, I'm still waiting to raise the pots and pots. We've got a, we've got a pot. <laughs> yeah. um, but that would simply be about fundraising. And I think it changed the conversation. So lots of people said, OK, we, we, we're really keen to... Um, we want to do something. What can we do that would make a difference? And so, uh, actually, I didn't, I didn't know. I knew some things that I thought I could do that would make a difference that would have an impact on the health of the oceans. But I genuinely didn't know. So we started having... That I think the internet allowed us to have conversations which were, well, I can do this, what do you think, what are you doing, and finding that information out very quickly and sharing that inf information much more quickly. So it doesn't mean that sea changes are experts in creating community sea changes or, or certainly in having all the answers about what we all should do individually, but we have, we have gained very quickly lots of ideas about what people can do and we've gained the capacity through the internet of sharing those ideas very quickly with mm -hmm. lots of people. So that, I think that's the difference. I think sea changes could have happened 20 years ago, but we would still be in the startup phase two years down the line because actually we, we, couldn't, we couldn't have had the, the speed of information gathering and sharing and the conversation that we have or in, a potential to engage that we, we have now. Yeah. So I think, yeah, we've definitely got two answers to that. What, what can I do to help? question which is stick a pound in the pot yeah and and do some of the things that we're talking you know try and take some of these actions that, that are in in your daily conversation in twitter and facebook and elsewhere and, that's right and you can get ideas of what the lady in landlocked uk can do about the pacific garbage patch and so on i mean we can make start making those connections and coming up with ideas which that's is, right which is wonderful. And, it, and it is sorry to, uh, mm. to go on but in a way it's that thing about really making people feel like um, I have a part to play. So actually, you know, we, over the next... We've funded six projects. We're about to fund uh, another, hopefully about ten projects over the next uh, six months. And, um, you know, it's great to think that I can sit on the beach, beautiful sunny day, pick my phone out, text, text a pound donation, um, and actually my quid, every, every penny of that quid goes to make a direct difference. Um, and I'm, I'm having, playing a part, having an impact. So obviously, it's a small part, and it's not necessarily going to address the big picture, but it plays a part. Well, I think that's a part of the big debate, really, is, is you know, getting people to realise that individual actions do make a difference, yeah, and that's do. got to be where we start. Otherwise, yeah. we will just go, well, there's nothing I can do, let's yeah. give up. And I think that's partly what digital is helping us. Being connected to other people who have similar ideas makes you feel like, oh, actually, it isn't just me. I definitely can make a difference because we can pass this on and we can all, together we can act. And I'm yeah, sure that'll right. be some of the success stories, I'm sure, stem from that kind of thing. And we'll come on to that. Um, and I want to, I want to move on to the other gentleman in the room who hasn't yet said anything, and I apologise for that. Um, because I think you're coming here talking about one very important part of this whole picture of, of the oceans and the problems and the, and the benefits that the, um, the oceans give for us. And that's 
And that's really digging into the idea of why, why the sea, why the oceans, why the coasts matter. So we have here Man on the Beach. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity uh, for you to um, see the man in person because this is a very uh, elusive <laughs> gentleman who has a fantastic website. If you haven't already, I encourage you, and that would be one thing I would definitely say to do after this event, is to check out manonabeach.com. Manonabeach.com. And, um, uh, and um, to, as a, by way of a very brief introduction, I'm sure he will tell you much more about what he does. Um, essentially, you describe yourself, and I love this, as a whisper in the crowd. As some, he goes to beaches, to the edges of the sea, and gets people who are there to talk about, essentially ask them a simple, very simple question. And that is, actually, I'm going to let you ask the question. What's yeah. the question that you ask people you meet on the beach? Man on the beach is a construct. He's a passive everyman. My name's Ian. Man on a beach, on the website, exists to provide a seamless link, if it's working well, between enhanced beachgoers and largely urban people in cities. And the role of man on a beach within that construct is to ask the question, what does the beach mean to you? So I started in Cornwall 20 months ago, where I live, and where I've lived for 20 years, and brought children up on the beach. My children both work in areas that are affected by their proximity to the beach during their upbringing, and became sensitized over time to the beach environment and decided, when circumstances allowed, in a tentative fashion to start with, that I'd take my Android camera, coming from an IT background, out onto beaches where I lived, which I was intimately aware of, and explore something that I felt deeply, which was um, an enhanced effect when I was on the beach. And that enhancement manifested itself in many different ways. And I, in a way, I found that more interesting than the general point of feeling good and enhanced. And I wondered why sometimes it enhances creativity, and other times it was settling and rebalancing. And other times it was fun, other times it was restorative. And I thought, everybody seems happy here and has done all the time I've spent on the beach. Why don't I try to get an answer to a neutral question that I'll come up with? And the prospect of being known for doing that was frightening. So I thought it would be a more effective project if I created a construct who was a passive everyman called Man on a Beach. I thought it would work well in the project as well because, as I suggested earlier, it would provide a link between the enhanced beachgoer and the urban people. And I, as I say, it was tentative. I, didn't, I thought it was a bit, a bit of fun. We'll see how it goes. And I, 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 was in, and I did this on YouTube. Um, no funding, no business plan, no idea, but a deep instinct to do it, which I didn't really understand, but I do now. And I quickly started to be showered with these profound enhancements, and I thought, luckily, to record them early on. And it, it became very popular. And so I, I I wrote a WordPress site and put that up and replaced the YouTube page with this WordPress site. And it just went on and on and on. And after a year and 120 beaches in Cornwall, which I was revisiting by season, um, I devised this strategy that I've used and this straitjacket, so to speak, that I've applied to myself, which is to do a scene setting film of the beach, take some photos, but both of which are designed to contextualize the key part of the visit, which is this question to a beachgoer I've just met in an unsolicited fashion, um, answering the question, what does the beach mean to you? And when you go onto the site, you'll see that the construct man on a beach is a passive entity. So I will never speak other than to say that unless I'm led in a direction. My personality is very outgoing. But the construct man on a beach is deliberately seamless so that you can feel that. And it's grown and grown and grown. And, and I started to attract businesses that wanted an association with this well-being aesthetic. And I've now got 97 of them around the country. And they, what I call, support the website and 
of each answer, the man on of each question, what does the beach mean to you? And I'm really proud for that financial support from those businesses because it's now become my living. I have no other funding than that which I've raised myself by uh, partnerships with businesses who understand what I'm doing. And it's enabled me to develop it from a Cornish product by origin into a national product. And I, I now revisit nine UK regions, Norfolk, Suffolk, Dorset, Sussex, East Lothian, Fife, Moray, Angus, Aberdeenshire, um, on a seasonal basis. So most of those beaches, and there are nearly 300 of them, have um, a spring, summer, autumn, and winter visit. And the outpouring of genuine affection and enhancement and awareness of danger, because remember, it's a neutral question, that I've had has been overwhelming. It's clearly touched a nerve because it's had 137,000 hits in the last 12 months, this website, with no PR activity. It's lightly followed in social media because I haven't really engaged with that. And this might be something we can talk about. I've got a few hundred followers on Twitter and a few hundred Facebook likes, but all I do is prosaically post the next beach every day. But I recorded all of this information and luckily I've been able to now disseminate it through, chart, through charts. So I can tell you, for instance, I've had 696 narrative interviews with people and I've had 485 different answers to that question. Okay. What does the beach mean to you? Can you tell us all of those tonight? No. Can you sum those up for us? Though? What sort of answers do people give for you? Um, well, um, I, I've split them into six sections very briefly, uh, emotional and spiritual, occupations and livelihoods, friends and family, sensory, nature, and activities and hobbies. And can I say the top five? Please do. Yeah, yeah 485 of them. What do you think is number one by miles? It is an emotional and... Uh, no, it's not. It's a friends and family one. Yeah. In fact, number one and number four are both friends and family. Number one, by quite a long way, and it's always in a positive way, is childhood. Yeah. Uh, number four is family. So they're both friends and family. Number two is a sensory one, beauty. Number three is a, a livings one, it's livelihood. Oh, no, it's not. It's activities. It's dog walking. <laughs> and number five is... Um, my living, because I interview a lot of fishermen, and that may inform our discussion later, um, and conservation people and uh, volunteers on the beach, as well as RNLI people. So um, it's surprising to me how much work is done and how many people so you, do work on the beach. So how do you choose who to speak to? How does this actually work? I mean, um, I was sort of going to say, I mean, I've, I've known uh, Tom and Helen for a while now, but we, our paths haven't crossed yet until tonight. I think that's just because I haven't been on the right beach at the right time to, to be interviewed. Yeah. Uh, how, how do you actually start talking to people? Well, now I've become confident and, and um, I was very, very nervous and anxious about it to start with. But if I was to look at this as a group, I would pick the person who was watching the group. So there's one trade secret. I'll tend to look for perhaps the introvert in a group who might um, be more forthcoming. But I think it works. They're strangers. That's the that's mm. first thing to say. They're strangers. They're totally un, unheralded. And I think why it works is that I, I am really interested in that question. And it must show, because if you look at the films, they're happy to be talked to. And I don't know why they are. And I've had three rejections in 696 approaches to people. And it does feel like it's pulling me along. And I hope that doesn't sound disingenuous. And I almost feel sometimes that I'm, on, I'm here and there's going to be someone there. I know I'm going to walk around that corner. And there, you know, this is 6 o'clock in the morning on Paul Bear Beach in Cornwall on the Roseland Peninsula. And there always seems to be somebody there, and people have been so generous in what they've said. Um, but in terms of its nature, I think I'm passive, and that's what's helped. So many people use the natural environment as a self-promoting tool, and I'm actually publicity-averse. And I'm passionately supportive of my project, and so I've used the man-on-a-beach construct 
as a person that I can be within. And I fervently want people to listen to the beachgoers rather than me. And that's the whole point of the website, that you can go on a Sunday night before you go to work and you can listen to somebody who has an enhanced relationship with this beautiful place where the air, land and sea meet. And it's as simple as that. That's a wonderful thing. I think um, I definitely encourage you all to go and have a look and uh, to, to, to see just what it is that, that we're talking about here. Um, I think it really brings in for me one of the things I wanted to try and talk about this evening, um, which is something um, that I think about a lot um, when it comes to the things that I do online. And I think I do very different things to you, and I almost feel a bit crass as a consequence that I'm there. I'm Helen Scales. I'm tweeting. I'm the one shouting about how wonderful I think all of this is. And you're very quiet, but it's working in a very, very strong, positive way, but in a very different way. Yeah. And maybe that's one of the joys of what we're talking about tonight, the digital world, because it can be all of these things. But one of the things that concerns me a lot is who am I talking to? Am I just talking to the Guardian reading, um, paid up environmentalists who already are behind me with all of this, and they just follow me on Twitter or, or, or share, you know, read my blog posts because they want confirmation of what they already think? How do we get through to the people who don't care about the oceans or who haven't really thought about it or really don't have a second thought about what fish they're eating or any of those things? And it seems to me that what your project is, it, it really is cutting out all of that. It's not you're, talk, you're not talking to one group of people. You're not addressing conservationists or scientists. You're just taking a really simple idea that's accessible to everyone, which is you're walking along a beach. And that's all that matters. And you're there for all your own reasons, and that's what you're trying to tap into. And I love that. Because I do, I do wonder what I can do as an individual and, and as someone who, you know, as a part of a network to get beyond that kind of, I'm just talking to people who, like I say, who, who already agree with me. Well, I think it works because I'm not in it. And this construct is a deliberate placement to enable you to hear the beachgoer. And that's a voice that isn't heard enough. There are so many people fronting organisations that res represent this wonderful enhancement. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you could just get to those people who can articulate it without a barrier? And that's, so that's what I've done. Yeah. I'm, so I'm, really, I'm really enthusiastic about what um, Man on the Beach is doing. If we, as an organisation, we need to present arguments for why marine conservation is important. So you can present the argument that it's valuable for the, the ecosystem, like nature's value. The sea does stuff for us that we don't calculate in our, in our economy. A big one for me just recently, is, is the, the health benefits of the sea. Now, we all know the M5 in the summer is, is evidence enough that everyone's going to the sea for the holidays. Why is that? Why do we go to the sea? And there's the digging on the sand, there's the active bit, there's the, the surfing, boating, but I think it's more than that. So, as a conservation organisation, we need to, to build up our, our argument, our, build up our case for why the sea, in its natural state, is important and needs to be protected. And we can use various, all of these arguments. And I think the, the more we can say it's about the health of the nation, the mental and spiritual and, and physical health, then I think, of course, the government has to pay for our health. They have to pay for our health care. And if, I think that's a really important argument I, I, I think we need to tap into. It's very interesting. That, sorry, there's a, a study, I think, just came out last year, and um, some scientists looked at data from the last census, and... Um, they showed that people who lived within one kilometre of a coast reported themselves, who so self-diagnosed themselves as being healthier and I think also happier if they lived closer to a coast. And this was most affected, it was most apparent in the, um, the lower socio-economic groupings as well. So it really does matter if we live near to the coast. I mean, there's various factors that might explain part of that, but... It is, it is there, I think. Mm. And I was, yeah. was going to say, we, um, one of the things that we do to try and engage people is we write, we write a blog. And in the last uh, couple of months, we wrote a blog, uh, based on, after a conversation, actually, with a friend where somebody said, I can't really see how the sea does matter to me. Um, we are still just about friends. And um, I went away and very quickly wrote a blog about why the sea should matter, including lots of health benefits, but also the environmental benefits of that. And it was, I mean, it wasn't long, but it was just a short list of sort of 10 ideas of 10 reasons why the sea should matter. And 
I've probably written 10 or 15 blogs, and by, by a, an absolute mile, that blog was hit upon uh, so many more times. And the, I mean, routes from people had seen it on, they'd gone and visited via Twitter, via Facebook, by various other different uh, sites, including LinkedIn. And, it, you know, I guess the, the question is that people, re- people really engaged with that, that question, why does the sea matter to me? You know, why, uh, what do I need to, you know, what, why should I invest time in it? Um, and how's it going to affect my everyday life? So I think you're absolutely right, Tom. It does hit upon something very fundamental, is that we're looking for the answer to that question. That's great. I think uh, what I'd really like to do as well is, t- and um, Tom, you've suggested you might have some thoughts on this. Um, we've touched on the, the perhaps the drawbacks of kids being indoors on their computer screens and, and iPods and so on, um, smartphones, and not outside and rootling around in a rock pool. But there are we, we already have some tangible ideas of how the digital world has helped um, the oceans and has helped make that connection back to, to people being more aware, conservation being more tangible. I, um, I certainly have one I'd like to talk about and then maybe see what, what else comes up. There was this fantastic example just last year. I don't know if any of you were aware of the spate of shark attacks that happened in Western Australia. It was, uh, it was a sort of abnormal number of people were getting attacked and unfortunately killed by great white sharks. And as a, off the back of that, the government um, proposed um, culling the sharks. They wanted to go out and kill, find the individual that did it, and also apply a mass cull to sharks in general. And conservationists were kind of, and scientists were saying this really wasn't, this isn't the approach we should be taking, both scientifically and obviously from a conservation standpoint, it doesn't make any sense. And, um, and, a, and a campaign was set up, um, I think it was called Support Our Sharks, a chap called um, Ryan Kempster in Western Australia set this up, and, um, and in October, on October the 23rd, it had 2,000 signatures, um, just over a month later, because of the online connectivity of networks, and I think Twitter was a really big part of this, it had 19,000 signatures. And, I th- and he we were convinced that that was a big part of the U-turn that the government then undertook, which was, yeah. okay, we're not going to do this cull. This is against public opinion. We will do something else. And in fact, they're now plowing their money into research into other ways of, of dealing with the problem of trying to deal, figure out... Um, shark repellents instead of, of killing them, figure out ways of not getting them to interact badly with people. Um, so I just thought that was a really lovely example, mm. a kind of really tangible example mm. of there are people who care about this and this is a way for them to show that they care and, and are unhappy with the, what's going on and they can make a difference and that actually happened. I think that's really wonderful. Mm. Um, so I don't know if you have anything to add or... Well, my, well, my example is we, we all know, I think most, we, most have signed up for Hughes Fish Fight uh, when he was talking about um, discards and the common fisheries policy, 750,000 signatures, which is unheard of uh, in these kind of campaigns. And it, the, the, the common fisheries policy is the, the thing that, that affects all of the way that, that, that Europe goes fishing, how they fish, what they catch, what they throw away, important stuff. And the, the agreement which was reached two weeks ago was better than most of us could have hoped for. And I think a lot of it comes down to Hugh, our charismatic um, firebrand of a chef, through that series, led that campaign and got an awful awful lot of people to sign up. I'll just give you a a counterpoint to that, is that every day there are issues which, if you're signed up to a VAS or 38 degrees, there are issues, uh, injustices all around the world that people are asking us to sign up to. Now, what I also worry about is that the email comes through, so all you have to do is write your email, sign it, and it goes, and you've put your signature to all of these issues. In a way, it becomes too simple. It becomes, my engagement in that issue is, all right, I'll sign it, and it goes off. What I worry about is that as this more and more issues come our way, be they about conservation, be they, be they about um, poverty, be they about um, some kind of uh, global injustice that we are simply engaging with these in too, too shallow an extent. And I think with, the, with conservation and marine environment, it's, it's such a perfect example why we need to really get in it and involve ourselves in it, not just sign the signature for it. And I, I think with the oceans, it is something that there are practical things that people can do as an individual um, to make a difference. It, because we have, well, partly because of the direct connection between the food that we eat and the decisions we make as seafood consumers, that's one mm. thing. Mm. Um, our use of plastic bags, plastic waste, that sort of... There are these direct connections that you can make, so possibly it's easier to see those, um, and especially if you tell people about them and use 
the digital world to do that. I don't know if you, uh, any of you saw that fabulous, I think it was kind of like an advert for plastic waste in the oceans. And it was this a picture of just a beautiful clear ocean and a little kid lifting up the corner and it was just full of plastic bottles and rubbish. So you're, some of you are nodding. And, you know, I think it went through a whole load of rounds on Facebook of everyone was posting this image and the quote was, even though you can't see it, it's still there, yeah. I think. It was something like that. And that obviously was very powerful and people enjoyed that image and shared it. Um, and, yeah, and there's a connection there between what we do and, and, and the ocean. I feel like I should... We've, we've had a bit of a chance to sum up, but, Ian, I wondered if you do have any final thoughts you want to add to that last point or, or to any of the other last few Just, questions we've had. There's a great power in being passive and trusting people's instincts and genuine love for the natural environment. And to have the confidence to do that, I think, is a positive contribution not just for me and my little website, but for all of us. So if we have faith, we talk, talk about children, but all of us, um, if we have faith in uh, people's goodness, and I can tell you, because I've witnessed it firsthand and have done every day for the last 20 months, that people are enhanced in a positive way by being in a chaotic environment where the air, land and sea meet, if you can enable people and encourage them and promote the articulation of that enhancement, those people's activity is much more effective than tub thumping. And there's a great power to being a whisper in a crowd, because the more of you whisper, the louder the voice gets and all pervasive it gets. And that's my approach to my work it's hard but you have to leave yourself behind and trust people and when they tell you things you don't like about fishing for example be brave enough to articulate it or provide the platform for their um, views and don't comment trust them and most people are well-meaning um, and just, just a couple of quick thoughts. One is, I think, just that importance of having the right conversation. So whether it's being passive in the conversation or whether it's, you know, making sure that we have, we're saying the right things to the right audiences, I think, is so vital. And if you want to, be, you know, to do something to change the oceans today, it's very sort of simple. Just uh, log on to my website. There's a whole list of ideas that will help you. Uh, and uh, you'll see something there, something there that we hope will appeal and change the sea.